Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you warmly to the Jean Monnet Lecture, which is the highlight of our ECB annual research conference. As you all know, Jean Monnet was one of the fathers of Europe, being instrumental to the establishment of the European Coal and Steel Community, which later became the European Union. Each year, the lecture in his honor is devoted to a topic of importance for the future of Europe. We are enormously honored that this year's speaker is Professor Claudia Goldin, who is joining us remotely today. Welcome, Claudia. Claudia is one of the most distinguished economists. She earned her PhD in economics at the University of Chicago and is professor of economics at Harvard University. In fact, she was the first woman to be tenured in economics at Harvard. And she was also the first woman to receive an unshared Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel in 2023. Claudia won this prize in a field that did not even exist when she started working on it. As a student of Bob Fogel, Claudia started her research in economic history and labor economics. At the time, women were not considered very relevant when studying labor markets. So it was a courageous decision to focus her research on a topic that many may have considered to be of secondary importance. She approached her research, as she said herself, like a detective who tirelessly investigates all the avail available evidence to find an answer to big questions she considered to be of utmost importance. This meant digging into archives, as there was hardly any research on those questions. Let me mention just a few examples of what we have learned from Claudia's work. Having compiled and analyzed vast amounts of historical data, she showed that female participation in the US labor market did not continuously increase, but followed a U-shaped path over time. Female participation declined as the economy transformed from an agrarian to an industrial society during the 19th century and increased only when the services sector started to expand in the early 20th century. One important explanatory factor was a change in social norms regarding women's responsibility for the household and the family. This finding suggests that one cannot count on economic growth to automatically reduce gender differences in the labor market. Claudia also demonstrated the important role of education and occupation for the gender gap in earnings. In the early decades of the 20th century in the United States, this gap diminished as women increasingly took better paid jobs. However, she also pointed to earnings differences in the same occupation, which tend to rise at the time of the first child, related to the uneven split of care work. As she once said, we are never going to have gender equality until we also have couple equity. Due to Claudia's work, gender economics now has a firm place in our profession, as exemplified by an NBR working group on that topic, co-chaired by Claud Claudia. But she has also contributed decisively to fostering the representation of women in the economics profession. On a personal note, I benefited from her generosity when she invited me to Harvard as a postdoc upon the recommendation of my PhD advisor without even knowing me. And this may have been one reason why I could advance my career despite having a six-month-old baby at the time. I'm still grateful to Claudia for this support. Today, Claudia is once again going to tackle one of the big questions. Her lecture is entitled, 
babies and the macroeconomy. And it focuses on the relationship between fertility rates and female labor force participation, as well as the split of unpaid household and care work among women and men. After the lecture, we will have some time for a Q&A. So we are very much looking forward uh, to your lecture. Claudia, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. What a, a lovely introduction. So I'm going to talk today, and it's your afternoon, my sort of morning, about macroeconomics and fertility, which is the impact of the macroeconomy on fertility. So babies have been front and center in the news. Consider recent political events in the U.S. and growing pronatalism in Europe. J.D. Vance, Republican vice presidential candidate in the U.S., recently asked whether voters could trust politicians who didn't have children. Can a childless cat lady, he said, run a country? Well, Angela Merkel did just fine, and no one questions the Pope's long-run interest in humanity. So babies also feature in pronatalist policies, such as anti-abortion and anti-contraception ones, often intended to counteract immigration's effect on population, as well as keep women in more traditional roles. More to the point of my talk today is why couples, women, and societies have had fewer children historically. The reduction in fertility in the period since the 1970s has been truly astonishing. The continued declines in more recent years have been unprecedented. Now, until around 1980, the central issue among demographers, economists, and policy wonks was the precise opposite, and it concerned a population explosion, what was known as a population bomb. That was the galvanizing issue of the day, akin to climate change today. It became even more important in the Cold War era at times than even the threat of nuclear war. According to the Ehrlichs, who wrote The Population Bomb in 1968, and I quote, in the 1970s and 80s, they said, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death. But they didn't. The birth rate took a nosedive throughout the world, with just a few exceptions. Now, as an economic historian, I must begin by noting that by the time the birth rate began to decline worldwide in the 1970s, fertility levels had already greatly declined across Europe and the U.S. In the late 19th century, the average woman would have had four to five, maybe even more, live births. But then the figure declined to about three in most parts of Europe and the U.S., Part of the earlier decrease was because infant death rates plummeted in much of the industrialized world in the early 20th century with advances in clean water and a better understanding and acceptance of the germ theory of disease. Consider the case of the United States drawn here going back to 1800. The U.S. total fertility rate, that's what's being given here, was extremely high in the early 19th century. The U.S. was an exceptionally rich farming country. Couples married early and rather completely. They had lots and lots of children. In fact, the 18th century fertility experience of the U.S., is what gave rise to Malthus's notions written up in 1798 that fertility responds to macroeconomic factors. But fertility then declined, even though people got richer. In fact, they got a lot richer. 
Malthus would have been deeply confused. So let's help him. Some of the decrease in fertility was because more children survived and couples could have fewer children with a target level. Around, 1970, around 1870, the average U.S. woman had five live births, but just 3.7 survived to age five. By 1920, when total fertility was three, almost all would have survived. The surprise, however, was the continued reduction in fertility long after the advance of modern contraceptive technologies and 70 years after child mortality began its decline. All nations, with the exception of those in sub-Saharan Africa, have experienced greatly declining birth rates. In fact, the world total fertility rate is now 2.7, 2.27, and it's above two, mainly because of countries like Nigeria, drawn here, and others in sub-Saharan Africa that have total fertility rates that are much higher than two. And the greatest surprises have been the plummeting of birth rates in tradition-bound countries in Asia, the Middle East, and as well as in Catholic and Orthodox Europe. I should know that the big players worldwide, and I'm sure you're thinking about those, India and China, each have their own fertility stories. The total fertility rate in India today is actually less than two. And China's fertility plummeted, as you can see here, long before the famed one-child policy. So let's discuss why total fertility declined in the past 50 years, and what that has to do with macroeconomics. I hope to convince you that it has a lot to do with the macroeconomy in a long run sense. Now, the opposite question, the impact of fertility on the macroeconomy, has spawned an extensive literature on optimum population growth. According to a recent paper by Chad Jones, if innovation is a positive function of the size of the population, we are headed, I'm sorry to say, for the empty planet equilibrium shown here, rather than that of the expanding cosmos. But these are the fun models of growth theory and not reality. So let's get back to reality. Why has fertility changed over time? There are several ideas concerning why income has generally been negatively associated with birth rates. One comes from the negative substitution effect regarding parental time, especially the time of women. Another reinforcing one is the classic quantity quality trade-off model. With more income, parents substitute higher quality children for more children. The ability to control fertility is necessary, but never sufficient. Although we have generally seen a negative effect of income on fertility, a positive relationship by country and even within some countries has become evident more recently. A revealing summary of these forces is in a paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives called Will the Stork Return to Europe and Japan? It was published some time ago in 2008. The authors are Fire, Sacerdote, and Stern. The idea in that paper is that there is, as you can see here, a U-shape to a relationship between, and on the axis, our female employment, the labor force participation rate here, and on the other axis, fertility. And you could draw it as well between income and fertility. Nations with low income and low female employment have high fertility, 
with economic growth, female employment rises, and fertility falls. But female employment may not increase that much in some nations, and interestingly, in some countries, fertility will fall even more. Why is that? I'll provide a simple schematic and then move to some interesting data. Societies could move over many decades from that point A where we began to a point like C, from a state of high total fertility to low and low female labor force participation to a point of lower total fertility and higher female labor force participation. But what seems to happen is that some countries, especially those we will see that develop very rapidly, that some countries move instead to a point like B, not as high a female labor force participation rate, but a very low total fertility rate. The shift from A to C involves a decrease in the division of labor in the home. Men will do more childcare, for example. An important difference between the countries at B and the countries at C is that those at B do not experience a shift in the division of labor in the home. Women, therefore, are expected to work both in the home and in the marketplace. Therefore, they are forced to cut back, obviously, at one or the other, and sometimes both. Thus, their employment doesn't increase as much, and their fertility is, falls even more. Children take time, and that time isn't easily contracted out or mechanized. Caring for children is simply not like washing clothes. Therefore, much of the change in fertility will depend on whether men assume more work in the home as women are drawn into the market, particularly if the home has children. If they don't, women will be forced to cut back on something. I will build on this insight and explain why the incomplete transition to point B occurs and why some countries thus move from A to B, whereas some move from A to C. Economic advances, by which we often mean income or urbanization, educational change, may be so rapid that there is too little time for generations to fully adjust to an altered structure of household and market production. One may think of these countries as having social norms that are out of touch with economic reality. These nations and their cultures are often described as more traditional. In some cases, we might even use the word patriarchal. Thus, the rate of growth of the macroeconomy has effects on microeconomic decisions. Let me take these ideas to the data. But first, what I want to do is I'll discuss a group of countries that includes many in the Eurozone, some in the EU only, and a few that are in neither. I will create three groups of these countries. The first group will include the US, Great Britain, France, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. Call those group one. I've excluded a number of countries because the graphs get very messy. So let's just think about these. They are currently countries with moderate total fertility rates, although all currently have total fertility rates that are less than two. Group two countries include Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Japan, and Korea. These are countries with currently very low fertility, most of them less than 1.3, and one Korea is less than one. I won't have time to discuss another group, 
those in Eastern Europe that were once part of the Soviet Union, like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, or with Soviet satellites, such as Romania and Hungary. Before their independence, these countries had higher total fertility rates than the rest of Europe, but are now more like those in Group 1. Let's first look at the long-run fertility histories of the Group 1 and Group 2 nations. For Group 1, and here the graph on the horizontal axis has year going from 1920, so it's a century. The vertical axis is total fertility. For Group 1, the past century shown here shows that there is periods before World War II that are uh, very highly volatile because of war and economic depression. They produce delays in marriage and family formation. In consequence, let's limit the discussion and the view to the post-1950s for now. Note that the post-World War II baby booms occurred in many of these countries, but also the rather extreme baby boom in the United States, that green line. Also note that around 1980, fertility in all these nations had become fairly low. Now let's look at the group two nations. And remember, this is Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Japan, and Korea. These countries are mainly latecomers to economic development and fertility levels. And once again, this is the full century, began extremely high. And you can see, it especially for Korea and Japan. Once again, let's limit the analysis or our view here to the post 1950s. And you can see that once again, Korea, Japan, and most of these countries, Spain, have relatively high fertility in the 1960s, 1970s, then it goes down and it continues to come down. Now let's put randomly a few of the nations so we don't have too many lines in the two groups on the same graph for the post-1970 period. With group two in orange, here I've chosen Spain, Italy, and Korea, and group one in blue, and I've just chosen France, the UK, and the US. Something really interesting is apparent. It is clear that group two, remember in orange, had high total fertility in the 1970s, but is now extremely low. Group one began lower, but is now higher than group two. So what explains the collapse of fertility, especially in the group two nations? And this brings us to the macro economy, to the rate of growth in GDP per capita, drawn here as log of GDP per capita, measured using purchasing power parity. First, the Group 1 nations. Despite this substantial volatility in the pre-1950s, Group 1 nations had fairly steady increases in GDP per capita over this relatively long period, the full century. But Group 2 nations, and here that's once again Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Japan, and Korea, did not. Rather, they mainly had economic stagnation, then collapse until the 1950s, and then extremely rapid catch-up in the post-World War II decades until the late 1990s or early 2000s. Not only did many of these countries have rapid growth after 1950, some also had huge migrations from rural areas to urban areas as in the case of Korea. And there was also, let us not forget, the Korean War and post-World War II rebuilding of many nations in Europe and Asia. Now let's consider the impact of rapid economic change among Group 2 nations. 
generations of parents and grandparents who spent their lives in rural areas and had low levels of education and income had children who would live in cities and be far more educated. The differences were enormously large. All nations in this period had high levels of growth, but for some, there were sharp breaks with the past. These breaks with the past have produced what I would call generational and gendered conflicts. Consider the following examples. First, the example of Korea. The green line here is total fertility across the past century. It is mapped onto the right axis. The blue line is the log of GDP per capita, as shown before, mapped onto the left axis. Consider a male baby born around 1980. That's the orange star here. He would have had two siblings, and his parents, born in the tumultuous late 1950s, the gray star, would each have had five siblings. The parents would have been raised in a period of rapidly rising levels of income and major migration from rural areas to Seoul. They would have brought their traditional ways to the city and raised their son with a sense that he should marry, as they did, into a traditional Korean family. The son marries around 2005, the yellow star, in a period of rapidly rising college for women and female employment. But he carries with him the traditions of his parents, which clash with increased female employment. Fertility, in consequence, becomes even lower. This is the story I told before when I summarized the findings in the Stork paper. A similar story could be told for Italy, perhaps about five years earlier. The son here would be born in 1975, his parents born in 1955, the son marries in the year 2000. But it is not the story one would tell for the Group One nations drawn here, France and Sweden. Their citizens have had a longer time to be thrust into modernity. The expectations of parents for their children, especially their sons, were less radically different from what they experienced. Evidence on differences in unpaid work hours in the home between men and women supports the notion that the countries I've identified as having sudden and rapid growth are also the ones with an excess number of hours worked by women in unpaid household and care work relative to that work by men. The horizontal axis in this graph is the difference in unpaid household and care hours per day between the average male and the average female by country. It is graphed against the total fertility rate. The number for Korea, for example, is about 2.8 hours and is almost three hours in Italy. But in Sweden, it is 0.8 hours, and in France, it's 1.4. And by the way, the countries in my three groups are the orange squares here. Not all of the countries that I chose were in this data set, but many were. Other macroeconomic factors have been reinforcing, but they do not do as good a job differentiating among countries, as does this macroeconomic explanation. For example, there's a recent and interesting literature on the rise of the gerontocracy, caused perhaps by a twist in the wage structure in favor of older men rather than the new entrants. And this has led, according to the writers of these papers, to an increase in the age at which sons move out of their parents' homes. 
The rise of the gerontocracy has probably therefore added to the decrease in fertility. Additional factors include social programs intended to increase the birth rate by making children less of a personal responsibility and more of a community one. But many very low fertility nations have instituted pronatalist policies without very much effect. You may be wondering about China and its one-child policy. The total fertility rate, as I previously noted, declined in China before that policy was enacted. But the policy has had important consequences for increasing investments in daughters. If a couple can only have one child, a substantial fraction of those children will be daughters. And even with sex selective abortion that has occurred in China. Even in a society that greatly values sons, as is the case in China, daughters will be given more resources, especially education. Note in this graph that Taiwan's total fertility rate time series is actually very similar to that in China, despite not having a one-child policy. Policy may not matter as much as the macroeconomy does. So let me summarize. I've shown that changes in birth rates have been nearly ubiquitous around the world, that they aren't always due to changes in contraceptive practices or to legal constraints, although they can be. In addition, they aren't always due to government policies, but they can be. I have emphasized instead that they are often due to macroeconomic changes, especially those that impact differences across generations and thus also across the genders. Rapid economic change often challenges strongly held beliefs, and beliefs change more slowly than economies do. Traditional people are catapulted into modernity. There is income to educate girls as well as boys and health care that will ensure that they will survive to adulthood. Rapid economic change leads to rapid reductions in total fertility rates, but also, as I've said, to generational and gendered conflicts. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia, for uh, a really fascinating uh, lecture. I mean, it's interesting to see that in, in uh, your chart, I mean, still, if I, if I read correctly, in, in all the countries, uh, women uh, contribute more to unpaid household and care work than men. That's correct, right? In all the countries. Right. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that hasn't changed. All right. So well, it has uh, changed, but it's still... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, still sure. Differences. Yeah. Uh, so we have time uh, for questions, and uh, so I would like to uh, open the floor uh, to anyone who would like to ask uh, Claudia a question. Yes, please. I think you get a mic, and maybe you can uh, quickly introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Stein Klaassen so from Yale University. I have a question, Claudia, and it's a politically a sensitive topic in the United States, of course, these days, but immigration. Um, is that a material factor to your story so far? Have you seen any changes there in terms of the fertility rates ad adapting, but also maybe to the macroeconomic playing a feedback uh, loop towards your pattern that you described? Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, that's a very interesting question. There are a lot of people who can answer that better than I can in the following sense, that we know that uh, <laughs> that immigrants, recent immigrants, have higher fertility rates than the native population. So um, one reason that fertility declined somewhat in the U.S. in the previous uh, 
five years uh, was due to the fact that immigration was relatively low. Now immigration <laughs> is relatively high, so we have to go back to the fertility rates and look and see what they are. But my guess is that they're a little bit higher. Uh, but your question, I think, is more about how people adapt and respond. And that's uh, a little bit beyond my comfort zone. <laughs> and, and as I said, there's a fair amount written on the degree to which new populations, immigrant populations, uh, one might use the word assimilate, uh, adapt to the norms and traditions of the place that they have that they have entered. But a very good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So please, Marie. Marie Herova, ECB. Thank you so much for this very insightful keynote. Um, I was wondering, in your, in your speech, you made a difference between the role played by these generational conflicts driven by the microeconomy, the parental expectations for their sons, and uh, the role played by government policies. And I was wondering whether the two are actually connected, meaning you know, those societal expectations can also drive the policies. In particular, let me give an obvious example, the lack of affordable full-day daycare that basically make it impossible for women to both have a career and a family. So how do you think about this connection? Thank you. No, I think that that's um, a, a certainly a, a very, very important. However, what's sort of interesting is that the two countries that have, um, or at least one of the countries, Japan, that have had the most r rapid growth and what I would say the some of the most extreme generational and gendered conflicts have policies that are uh, the most generous, and yet they're not taken up. So just having the policies isn't sufficient. But but uh, it's certainly the case that uh, that that the society is going to create the policies, and the society is going to be the one that may be uh, coming out from these generational and gendered conflicts. So thanks. But um, Korea, for example, I, I, I dare not touch the issues going on in Korea now because they're a little bit explosive, and I don't think I fully comprehend them. So we have another question there, then. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Pavel Sikura from DG Legal Services, ECB. So my question will be not like directly linked to microeconomy. But uh, many times, uh, or several times, we heard here today the, the term unpaid care work. And I also read your book, like a uh, really, really interesting one, uh, The Career and Family. And uh, what I miss in this context, I missed it also in your book, is the reflection of the, uh, of the Institute of uh, Marital Property on the understanding of unpaid work. So what is marital property? It is the, the, the sharing of of assets by by the by the spouses. So that is the the institute by which I don't know, Melinda Gates got her seventy nine billion dollars. So that's the that's the that's the mechanism. So when we, when we when we hear and speak about the unpaid care work, but we do not consider these these financial flows, which are continuous, relatively massive financial flows, mostly from men to women. Do we do we make a, a, a honest analysis of that? And I also I didn't 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 see that that term or this this economic reality being reflected in your considerations of couple equity in your book. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, the, I, I I think that this would take a much much longer amount of time to digest because I think we have to get into a, a game theory models of of the household. But I think it's a it's an interesting question about whether. Uh, these are um, decisions that are made by two people to enter a relationship in which there is a set of, of, of trades, trades that are not constricting the individual, trades that are not reducing the individual's abilities, trades that are uh, optimal for each individual. 
And I think that's what is often being questioned when it's called unpaid care work. So, next question, please. Hi, uh, uh, just wait for the mic, please. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Pierre Yara at Columbia University. Uh, thanks for a really interesting talk. I was wondering about uh, some of the micro evidence uh, to support uh, the cross country uh, patterns that you displayed, and in particular the U shape, which was very interesting. Is is it true in the cross section of households in a, in a country, for example, that uh, you would actually see more fertil uh, an increase in fertility uh, as income increases uh, at the upper mm -hmm. end? Thank you. Yeah. So I defer to Michelle Tertilt on that, who has a wonderful recent paper on Korea. So, so it, the, the uh, in her paper, you would find that yes, there is an increase in Korea. In many other countries, you're correct in questioning whether there, whether we can observe a positive relationship. The positive relationship can be observed across countries, and you're asking whether it can be observed within countries. And in general, it can, but in Korea, according to Michelle's data, it can. Thank you very much. Yes, please, Bata. Um, Bartosz Maćkowiak, ECB. I would like to ask about the group three countries on one of your slides. So what's their story? So it seems like they, uh, similarly to group two countries, started out relatively poor and have re recently experienced fast growth, yet they are group, they form a separate group. So why, why is that? Why do they form a separate group? Yes. What's the story? Uh, be because when I look at the data, and I didn't uh, present it because I, th this is uh, a new material for me, so I don't think that I have completely digested Group 3. But Group 3 contains a number of countries in which uh, various uh, contraceptive technologies were not utilized and others were, okay? So it, it certainly looks in group two and group three countries that there was a, uh, a desire to have lower fertility. Of course, the period around 1989 to 1993 in many of these countries was highly disruptive. And so when you look at the data on fertility, you see these monumental drops and then an increase and then a steady decline. And, and so, uh, so I would have to rely on the experts on each of these countries. And of course, there are certain major differences. But if I confine my, uh, my site here to a Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, it seems pretty clear that at first there is disruption and then there's uh, there, these countries' fertility looks a lot more, and I don't know about, I have to look back at marriage patterns, looks a lot more like the rest of Europe. But, uh, you know, uh, of, of course, in many of these countries, abortion was contraception. <laughs> abortion is not a very, very good form of contraception. So, next question. Laura Gatti, ECB. Um, so, I would like to ask, um, what does the data on marriage slash uh, domestic partnership look like? Does it follow similar trends as fertility? Yeah, so I put the data on marriage together. I haven't, I, we, we can actually <laughs> look at it together. Uh, but I, they, uh, it, it sort of, I, I don't have domestic partnership separated out. So, so it would be marriage slash domestic partnership. Marriage ages in all of these countries has increased enormously. So, so it follows together with uh, fertility. Fertility is 
dropping like a rock. As I said before, the material on the gerontocracy is is very, very much rooted in the notion that when when young people can't don't move out of their parents' homes, they don't get married and they don't have kids. So marriage and fertility uh, go absolutely together. I don't have an answer for you on separating a domestic partners versus marriage, and generally they're they're included together. Alex. <clears throat> Alex Pop of ECB, uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. Uh, there is this old expression, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, so yes, I was wondering. Yes, lost an election on that. Uh, right. <laughs> I was wondering what role in your story the demise of the village uh, plays, which to me mostly means the demise of the uh, multi-generational uh, home. Uh, so I come from a group three country and uh, I was largely looked after by my grandmother when I was a child, which allowed my mom to work full time. Um, so, so, and, and maybe you know, childcare and, and these market provided services are not a perfect substitute for, for that, the multi-generational household. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. No, that's, a, that's an extremely good point, but the multi, multi-generational household is still putting the burden on the woman. I don't, I don't care if she's 56 years old. It's still a woman. And it may be that it, that it reduces the, uh, the returns to her of getting a law degree or getting an MD or even graduating from college or even getting certification in something. So the multidimensional household is a wonderful thing, I suppose. But if the multidimensional household means uh, grandma, then it's not exactly a multidimensional household. It's grandma. And let, let me continue just to say that for me, it takes a village means it takes a sense of the community and the population that your children are my children and my children are your children. And that's good government policy. So Luke, you wanted to come in? No. Okay. No come in, please. <laughs> Luke Laven, ECB, thank you so much, Professor Golden. Um, so I, I wanted to expand on the village concept. Uh, when I lived in the US, the way in our household we were able to raise children was to outsource it to nannies. And they're exclusively women and immigrants. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to sort of hear your take on it because it seems the way you are showing the numbers and focusing on averages underestimates some of these village dimensions. Well, I don't think I've underestimated the village dimensions because I haven't said anything about the village dimensions. But um, it, one of the big issues with childcare is that childcare is expensive. These babies take a lot of time of individuals. And so people often say, why is childcare expensive? It's pretty clear why childcare is expensive. If there are only two or three of these babies being taken care of by one person, it's going to be extremely expensive. So as a nation, as a community, as a village, if we think that that's important, then, uh, then it's going to cost a lot. If we think it's not important, we're going to uh, import uh, young women who are obviously immigrants to be nannies, and those who can afford them uh, will be able to have their kids taken care of, and their uh, parents will be able to go off and, and pursue whatever careers they want to pursue. I, I don't think that that, in my mind, that does not make for a happy country. So maybe let me uh, just ask one question. I mean, uh, you 
uh, mentioned that societal norms play uh, an important role, uh, also in the question whether uh, the household and care work uh, is actually split. So what explains that in, uh, that in some countries uh, there is uh, such a uh, more even split than uh, in others? Uh, if, if we knew the actual answer, we, we would be able to have good policy, but we can see. So my explanation here is that places that undergo very, very rapid change don't have enough time to respond and that the traditions and beliefs change very slowly. Economies can change very rapidly. Fertility can change very rapidly. And so places that undergo very rapid change don't have enough time to sort of alter, in some sense, the foundations, the structures uh, of, of, the, uh, of the society. They have enough time to alter buildings. They have enough time to change gross national product, but they don't have enough time to change the beliefs of the individuals. So that seems to be part of the issue. The uh, other aspects of this may be that some places are, are just uh, more, they cohere better. I mean, the U.S. is just large. One might say it's too large. So, so within the U.S., we have a Sweden. Within the U.S., we have a Finland. And, but within the U.S. as well, we, we probably have we have Texas, <laughs> we have Mississippi, um, and and so so there are. It's just it's very hard to have policies, national policies, that fit every single place. But I but I mean the point that I was trying to make here is is that norms, traditions, beliefs change more slowly than economies do. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting point. So we had another question over there. Yeah, hi, uh, Guido Scari, University of Pavia and Dutch uh, Central Bank. Uh, thanks for the, uh, uh, the fascinating lecture. Um, following up on this point, so because it's tentative to say this is a cultural or values or if you want um, customs, as you said, I mean, GRAP2 uh, is mainly Southern European, but you are saying that this is actually due to the fact that these uh, societies uh, were going very fast they didn't, and beliefs and norms are slower than uh, the economy. So that means that group two will become group one? Eventually. Probably. But uh, I mean, for example, we, we saw that group three sort of looks like group one now, and, and they had looked rather different before. Whether or not, uh, there are many demographers who claim that once total fertility gets below some level, it's impossible to get it up again. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, the test case here is clearly Korea. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You described in the uh, in the beginning that uh, not so long ago people thought that uh, the one of the biggest problem uh, was the high population growth. So now we've seen these falling fertility rate, and uh, the the question is: so maybe that that can change once again in the in the other direction. But I understood you in a way that uh, part of it is actually not easy to to reverse. Right. Yeah. And and and. Some parts that can be reversed really require uh, a tremendous amount of uh, resources and uh, on the part of governments to say, and, and Sweden uh, and, and some other Nordic countries are good examples that said we're going to have family leave for the first year. And then once the child is one, uh, there are there is daycare. And so that means that the financial burden <clears throat> is and the daycare is highly subsidized. I think it's subsidized about two thirds. Uh, that that's what I think of as it takes a village. 
That's the village that I would like to see in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also true that when you have an agent, uh, aging society, of course, the, 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 co the social security costs uh, explode and the few kids uh, that are there have to carry a very uh, large burden. Which is why many countries want more. <laughs> okay, we have another one. Very good. So you see, uh, uh, your topic raised a lot of interest, many, many questions in the audience. Thanks for a, a fascinating talk. Anton Nack of ECB. Um, I was just wondering um, whether this fact that marriages start later is not related to the fact that uh, first jobs also start later, and so people spend more time studying, preparing for a career, and so on. And that can be also affected by the macroeconomy, by progress that requires these highly skilled jobs and so on. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's, that's part of the rise of the gerontocracy as well. But, uh, uh, but it is the case that as you increase education, you're going to have later marriages. We see that, that that's true in, in all of these countries. But we've also added to it, and I computed <laughs> that it's it's not just in academia, it's also in law, it's also in medicine, that we've added more and more years. So I've computed that it's very simple. When I was a graduate student, when my husband Larry Katz was a graduate student, we finished our graduate work. We were out with our first jobs when we were 25 years old, maybe 26. Now it's it's our students are lucky if they're out when they're about 32. Uh, the same thing has been happening in many other professions. Exactly why this is the case is an interesting topic to explore and whether there is some rat race equilibrium going on or something else, or people think that their, um, uh, that their lifetimes have increased by so much that they're immortal. If you're immortal, it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> you can do nothing today. Um, so, uh, so I think that this is extremely important because it has led to even later marriages and, and most importantly, from my standpoint, I find that it is uh, harmful to women. If women would like to start a family by the time they're 32, 34, they're going to find jobs in academia uh, to be not to their liking. And that is not what I would like to see. I would much rather see people <laughs> come out when they're 25, 26, and take their first jobs than when they're 32, 34. But I, I agree with you that this is an absolutely fascinating interrelationship between the labor market, education, and marriage, and fertility. Yeah, socially this seems suboptimal. So th thank you very much. I think we have to come to the end because uh, we're yeah. reaching uh, the end of our, our session. Uh, it was uh, a fascinating talk, uh, Claudia. You gave us a lot of uh, food f uh, for thought. Uh, we're so grateful that you were able uh, to join us uh, today, uh, even if only uh, remotely. But it was a real pleasure uh, to have you here, to listen to you, to uh, discuss with you about this um, uh, big question, <laughs> important question. And uh, so this now concludes the first day of our annual research conference. Uh, tomorrow we are going uh, to resume for the second day, but let us uh, maybe uh, give a hand to Claudia and thank her for being here.